Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we have an expert with us, attorney Serene Shabaya, who is going to talk about some of the important issues of immigration. As you all know, we're facing um, a possible travel ban, um, and a lot of immigrants have been scared and concerned about what's going to happen in the future, and we're honored to have um, attorney Shabaya give us some guidance on what to look for in the future. Welcome. Thank you, Ala. It's great to be here. All right. So tell us how you got into immigration. How did you get to the point where you're doing the great work you're doing today? Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I myself am an immigrant. Um, I come from an Arab country. I came here initially as a student. Um, and, you know, over the course of my time here, I realized that I really wanted to stay. I wanted to be part of this community. And one of the best ways that I found to kind of claim my ownership of, you know, this country is to help make it better. Um, and I felt like working with immigrants and, and being an attorney for immigrants and for civil rights is uh, the best way to do that. So. All right. Well, uh, well, this is an honor to have you on here. And the first thing we're going to focus on is the travel ban. Now, there's been two travel bans, um, executive orders from, from President Trump, and we're trying to figure out how should people react to it, what is going on now, what should they anticipate in the future? Yeah, so initially, uh, in, at the end of January, on January 27th, uh, President Trump issued a travel ban for seven Muslim-majority countries, essentially saying that people couldn't come from there. Um, it was very broad, and it basically banned anybody from those countries, uh, initially including lawful permanent residents, people who had lived here for years and years, um, or who were coming on lawful visas. Um, all that kind of stuff, and it created intense chaos. Uh, obviously, as I think most of your most of your viewers are probably aware, um, there was like chaos at the airports. People were detained for hours and hours. They were sent back, um, deported back wh when they came in on flights. Um, and then one court after another essentially said, this is unconstitutional. You can't be stopping people with valid entry documents from coming in. And also that uh, the courts sort of found that in all likelihood, um, these orders were animated by uh, an intent to discriminate against Muslims specifically uh, because they were directed only at Muslim majority countries. Um, there's no evidence that this would actually improve national security, even according to the Department of Homeland Security itself. Um, and so the courts have said, you can't really be enforcing these, these travel bans. Um, after the first one was sort of stopped by the courts, um, Trump enacted a second one. Uh, it was more narrow, um, but it was also challenged in court. And two courts have actually found that it is also unconstitutional and have stopped its execution or its implementation. Um, one court right here in Maryland actually said that uh, the ban on entry into the United States is unconstitutional. Um, and another court in Hawaii said that both a ban on entry and also a ban on refugee processing, uh, that both of those provisions are unconstitutional. And primarily the courts are finding that because they are seeing that these bans are animated by a desire to discriminate against Muslims. And this is based on the words that Trump himself has said, the words that his advisors have said uh, from the beginning of his campaign and all the way up to the present moment when describing these travel bans. Um, now, let me ask you, now, if we're looking at, is there going to be a, a well, you know, they call the second one a Trump 2.0, um, is there going to be a 3.0? Um, is this, how is any lingering possible executive order going to impact those coming in and out of the country? So it's a very good question. I mean, I think that there are two, um, sort of two issues here. One is... Um, the text of the order, like what does it say and how would it affect people? And two is functionally, how is this being implemented and who is sort of feeling the brunt of these measures? Um, I think as far as the court process goes, the second travel ban is stayed and it's very unlikely that you can make it any narrower than they've already made it. Um, so I really, I don't anticipate a third version of this. Um, I think that the administration is just going to fight it out in the courts. Um, there's a Fourth Circuit argument scheduled for May. Um, so sometime in the next few months, I think there will be a more or less final resolution to this court fight, and we'll know one way or the other. Um, in the meantime, though, people from Muslim-majority countries, even those not named uh, in the order, have been seeing increased scrutiny. Um, they've been having harder times getting visas to come here. Um, they've had their, pro their the processing of their visas delayed in various ways. Like, let's say you're a U.S. citizen here, you're trying to bring your spouse from somewhere else. Um, 
those kinds of processing of visas have been affected by sort of extended extreme vetting, quote unquote. Um, uh, and, you know, I think at the airports, people have been seeing greater sort of times in, in, in inspection before they come in. Um, and, you know, just a, a far kind of harsher enforcement of um, minor infractions. Like if someone's overstayed their visa by a day, sometime very long time ago, they're being sent back, they're not being allowed in. Um, so I think people from those countries and from surrounding countries are seeing greater scrutiny right now, even though the travel bans themselves have been stayed by the courts and they can't be enforced. Okay. Um, so another issue is, I know you headed up a project at Dallas Airport to save those who were coming in and out. Can you tell us about what happened there? Yeah, so um, I, uh, along with a, a number of other attorneys, kind of made our way to Dallas Airport on Saturday, January 28th, because we had heard about the travel ban. We knew that it was going to be chaos, and we just wanted to see what we could do to help. Um, and it sort of was like this organic community of lawyers and translators and organized that formed together, organizers that formed together. Um, and we go by the name Dallas Justice Coalition. Um, and what we did in the first few days was essentially help the family members who were at the airport trying to find out what was going on with their families inside. Um, we tried to arrange legal representation for people who were stuck, either at airports in the United States or at airports abroad. Um, because the fact is that a lot of the people who we were helping, by the third or fourth day, the airlines were just not letting them on. So some of them were stuck, let's say, in Amsterdam airport for six days. They couldn't leave the airport, they couldn't come to the U.S., they just needed legal assistance. Um, what about so, at the actual airport here? Were the people being detained there? Yes, so at the actual airport, on the first day, um, day or two, I think, um, we had people who were being detained for hours and hours. Like, um, there was an elderly couple, for example, who was in there for about eight hours. Um, there were lots of people who were returning lawful permanent residents when initially it wasn't clear that they were going to be let in, um, who were detained for many hours. We were standing there with the families. We were answering kind of phone calls and text messages from people who had arrivals coming into the airport. Um, there was one family, for example, a father who was expecting his children from Yemen to come in. Um, that became the subject of a lawsuit, a successful lawsuit in the Eastern District of Virginia. Um, because his children were detained and then deported back, uh, even though they had valid immigrant visas to come into the United States. Um, so it was really chaos. The family members, like you could see the fear in their eyes. They didn't know what was going on with their family. Sometimes they weren't able to communicate with them. So let's say you have like a son or a spouse or, you know, an elderly parent, a pregnant person who's in there and it's been four hours since the flight landed and you have no idea what's going on, right? So we were there trying to kind of troubleshoot, trying to connect with Customs and Border Protection officials to give us some information. Um, I will say that at Dallas Airport, they were really not giving us any information at all. It was just very, very, it was like pulling teeth trying to find out anything. Now, let me ask you specific, because people should probably know, if you are detained at the airport, do you have a right to an attorney? So this is a sort of a complicated question. Um, if you're a US citizen, you always have the right to an attorney because you always have the right to enter the United States. Um, so as a US citizen, um, if you're detained at the airport, you can assert your right to an attorney. Of course, if you ask for an attorney, it's likely that you will be um, you know, detained for a long period of time, that this will delay things. Um, so I think people just have to make a judgment call about what's going on at that moment um, and whether they want to assert their right to an attorney or not. Um, if you're an immigrant, yeah, okay, go sorry. Ahead. And I just want to make sure you, um, we go over so what everybody's right is. So you're going to immigrants, so I'm going to let yes, you continue. Yes, absolutely. So if you are an immigrant, you have to answer questions about your immigration status at a port of entry. Um, so if you're coming in through the airport, you don't necessarily have a right to an attorney if you're being asked about your immigration status, like to examine, you know, do you have a right to come in or not? Um, but once you start being asked questions about things that are outside of that kind of narrow issue, um, you do have a right to an attorney, you can ask for an attorney. Um, you don't get like a government appointed attorney, you have to actually pay for one or find pro bono representation on your own. Um, but you can certainly assert that right, especially if you start feeling like your civil rights are being violated or you're being scrutinized in a way that's not appropriate. You can certainly say that you would like to speak with a lawyer. Um, and a number of people after the first days of the travel ban were actually in advance, we were advising them to in advance find an immigration attorney and get like a representation form that says I am represented by this attorney mm -hmm. so that in case they run into trouble they can tell the Customs and Border Protection officer 
here's the name of my attorney and the phone number of my attorney, please call them, they will be able to explain to you better. Um, because I think it's a very complicated, you know, immigration is very complicated. People are not always able to explain themselves, um, you know, where they stand or what their exact status is. So it's always helpful to have an immigration attorney on call. And we were actually helping to connect people who needed representation with attorneys who could represent them. Okay. Um, now, let me ask you, now what if you're a green card holder? Does that change things? Because a lot of people kind of feel like I'm a green card holder, I'm a permanent resident, I get the same rights as a U.S. citizen. Yeah, I mean, so lawful permanent residents, green card holders have uh, a lot of rights. They have kind of a gamut of legal protections. They can still be asked about their immigration status. So they, they still have to show, you know, here's my green card. This is why I, you know, I'm allowed to enter the United States. Um, there's some questions that come up, like, for example, if someone has been outside the country for more than six months and, and who is a green card holder, they may be asked some further questions um, so that they could show that there was a reason why they were away for that long. Um, so there are like, you know, slight technicalities. Of course, if someone was um, convicted of a crime after getting their lawful permanent resident status and then left the country and came back, there might be some issues that they may have to resolve. Um, so it's always a good idea, if you're not a U.S. citizen, whether you're a green card holder or any other status, um, it's a good idea to consult specifically with an immigration attorney about your own situation before you travel abroad and if you're already abroad before you come in. So let me go into the green card because you asked about the six months. What is the requirements to maintain a green card and for those who are, who are illegal right now, can they transfer and become green card residents um, in the United States? Well, if someone doesn't have uh, lawful status in the United States, it is extremely, extremely difficult for them to get lawful status in any way. Um, so this idea that people sometimes say, you know, you should get in line uh, and become legal, that's a fiction. Uh, it takes people years and years to actually be able to do that. The paths are very narrow. There are a lot of restrictions that apply because of unlawful presence and things like that. Um, so a lot of people who actually were here, for example, and then overstayed a visa or were fleeing violence, just had no way to become lawful, like to, to acquire legal status. I think that individual people might have a path to immigration relief, um, but that's something which would be like a very case-by-case -case determination and they should um, speak with an attorney about it. Um, you know, I think if you're a lawful permanent resident, you have a right to be here. Um, you're, you know, generally, you have a much more protected status. Um, but there are things that can interfere with that. There are a lot of crimes, even minor, minor offenses, uh, could really kind of interfere with your status. Um. Well, we're going to get back into that. We're going to take a short break. As you can see, this is very interesting information. If you know an immigrant, if you are an immigrant, if you're an unlawful resident, please stay tuned. We have more for you. So please stay tuned to chat with the lawyer. Hi, I'm Matt Martin, and I've had my fair share of bruises and injuries. But for many who put their lives on the line every day, it's not always the injuries you can see that hurt the most. Every single day, 184 veterans are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. When medications and therapy don't help, professionally trained service dogs can. American Humane has created a free guide to help veterans obtain these life-saving animals. For help, please go to AmericanHumane.org. Life is full of bittersweet transitions. It's difficult to know how these changes will impact us over time. They can hit harder than expected and may contribute to feelings of hopelessness. You good, sir? Or even thoughts of suicide. We got this. Support from friends and family can make a big difference to a veteran going through a difficult time. We've got this, Dad. Yeah. All right. Let's go. I got this. Together, our actions could help save a life. Learn more at VeteransCrisisLine.net. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and we're back here with expert attorney Serene Shabaya, who is going to give us more information about your rights as an immigrant. Um, and um, we're going to go to the right, and let's go back to the green card issue because a lot of people, so many people got green cards years ago, right? And some people want to get green cards. So, what are the requirements? What should they be aware of as someone who has a green card? 
As someone who has a green card, um, you have more rights and more protections than anybody else. Um, usually you can't be stripped of that status. I mean, you cannot be stripped of that status without a court process. Um, and what is a green card so people know what it is? So it's basically a document that you apply for that says that you are an immigrant, a permanent resident in the United States, and that allows you to be here, to have a family here, to work here, um, to do all the things that everybody else does um, who, who is here kind of like so. It allows you to be here the way that a U.S. citizen is with some restrictions. So you can't vote, um, you can't, uh, the, if you commit certain crimes, you may be subject to deportation. Uh, if you leave for a very long period of time, um, there may be this kind of presumption that you might have abandoned your status, but, there, but you can rebut that presumption by showing that there was a good reason why you were away. Um, but you know, there, I think green card holders generally have more protections than others. Um, but even if you're here without status, you actually do have the protections, the basic constitutional protections that we all have. So if you're in your house, for example, and someone comes knocking on your door and says, open up, this is you know, police or ICE or whatever, you have the right to say, I need to see a warrant signed by a judge. If they don't have a warrant signed by a judge, you don't actually have to open your door. Um, I think that you know, people think that just because you don't have lawful immigration status that you somehow don't have other rights, but that's not actually true. You're still protected by the Fourth Amendment. Um, in the privacy of your home, uh, you still are able to assert your right to an attorney. So if someone comes in and starts asking you questions or stops you on the street and starts asking you questions, generally you have the right to ask to find yourself an attorney, to say that you don't want it, you want to remain silent and you want to find an attorney and you have the right to actually do that. Um, you know, I think the process to actually become a green card holder is very complicated and it varies person by person. So there are ways to do it through employment, there are ways to do it through marriage, um, there are also some kind of categories of people who are able to apply through, say, the diversity lottery. Um, but these are all specifics that people will have to kind of examine in a case-by-case -case way in their own situations. Um, sometimes if you have a U.S. citizen child who turns 21, that child can, peti can petition for you. Uh, but they can't do that until they turn 21. So even if you have children who are U.S. citizens and you don't have status, um, it can be a long wait to actually be able to get status. Um, all this to say that um, you know, it's a very complicated space, a very complicated uh, kind of area of law, and it's a really important thing to consult with an immigration attorney. There are a lot of organizations that offer um, pro bono or free legal assistance um, you name to people. Uh, yes, so for example, Catholic charities in the entire region, like in, Mar in various parts of Maryland um, and in DC and in Virginia, have offices where you can call their offices and ask about their walk-in hours. You can go for a consultation. Um, there's also organizations like the Legal Aid Justice Center in Virginia. There are organizations in Maryland um, that work in the detention centers, like uh, CARE Coalition, the Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition. So if you have a family member who's detained, you can contact them and they will sort of do an intake with that person and try to find them pro bono representation. Um, there are a lot of other organizations that do this. So if you kind of do like a Google search for um, pro bono legal uh, immigration representation. There are organizations that will come up that, may be able, that you may be able to sort of call and ask for assistance. Um, but it's very important not to go to people who call themselves notarios. Um, What's, what is that again? So there are people who present themselves as though they have some kind of legal ability to represent and they don't. Um, they charge money for applications that should be free um, and they defraud people and they call themselves notario notarios, um, to kind of give themselves the air of authority that they have some kind of ability to do things for you or give, give you sort of legal representation, but they don't. Um, so it's really important to go to a well-established organization like Catholic Charities, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee, Refugee Services, um, you know, Care Coalition, places like that, that, that would be able to offer. Um, there's also the Maryland Immigrants' Rights Coalition has a website that lists all the resources of people who work um, uh, for f and provide free legal services to immigrants. So that's actually a very good place to go if you're looking for representation. Okay. Now, let's go into, if you're walking down the street and someone starts asking for your immigration papers, people are really scared of that and it happens. What, what, should, what, should, what should people do? So if you have a green card um, or if you are a non-immigrant, so you have a student visa or a tourist visa, you must carry those papers with you and you should show that you have immigration status when you're asked. Um, if you're uh, just kind of an, uh, sorry, I should actually backtrack. Those questions can be asked by federal immigration agents only. So state and local police officers do not have the authority to ask you about your immigration status, 
They do not have the authority to arrest you for immigration reasons only. So when you're approached by someone, the first thing you should do is ask who is speaking with you. Um, and make sure to check if this is, is this a state or local police officer. You can ask them why they're seeking that information. Generally speaking, Maryland police cannot ask you about your immigration status. Um, if it's like federal, if it's ICE um, or immigration, they can ask you in some circumstances and you have to actually tell them. Um, but generally speaking, I would advise people to you know, speak with immigration attorneys in advance, have a plan in place if they think that they might be at risk of deportation for care of their children or of elderly people that they're taking care of. Um, and just have a phone number of a trusted person memorized so that they can call someone to say, find me an attorney or put me in touch with, you know, with someone who can help me. Um, you know, in this, in this area, individual people have very different circumstances. So the uh, best advice you can get is individualized advice. But if you're walking on the street and you're approached and asked about your immigration status, really the first thing to, to know is that local police are not allowed to do that. They should not be doing that. Um, and if it's immigration that's asking you, you can actually, if you have immigration documents, you should show them. And if you don't, you should say that you would like to speak with an attorney. Okay, that's good to know. Now, um, what if you have fake papers that someone gave you, fake social security numbers, things like that, which, um, how should you respond? So that's a very, very serious offense in the immigration context. You should never lie. You should never present fake documents. You should really never ever say anything that is untrue. It's better to say that you are asserting your right to remain silent and to request an attorney than to say anything that is fraudulent or a lie. Using fake social security numbers, using fake ID, that stuff can actually stop you from getting immigration benefits that you would otherwise be entitled to. So some people who are at risk of deportation might actually qualify for individual immigration relief if they get to an immigration court. But if they're convicted of fraud or if, they're, if they've committed fraud, even if they're not convicted, but if they've committed fraud like using a fake social security number or um, fake ID or lying to immigration officials, it can be very, very serious. So it's just something like do not lie, um, do not use fake documents, don't ever, ever, ever under any circumstances do that. And if you feel afraid, if you feel uncertain, you just say that you want to speak with an attorney and that you want to remain silent. Um, I mean, if you're driving, you obviously have to show your driver's license. Um, and if you're asked for identification, you have to show identification. But if you're walking on the street and someone just kind of accosts you and starts asking you questions, you have the right to find out who is talking to you and why. Um, and if you're unsure, it's best to sort of remain silent and assert your right to an attorney. Now, what if a police officer stops your car and asks you for your immigration papers? A uh, police officer does not have the right to ask you for your immigration papers. That is just... Even they, if you're driving? Even if you're driving. The Fourth Circuit has very clearly said, um, and the Supreme Court has said, that state and local law enforcement do not have the authority to enforce civil immigration laws. What that means is that they can do their job. So they can ask you about your driving, right? They can, your driver's license, insurance, registration, all that kind of stuff. They can ask you about that, but they cannot ask you about your immigration status. And if they start asking you questions like that, you can certainly say, you know, I don't have to give you this information. One thing that it's very important to know is that in interactions with law enforcement, you should always stay calm and you should never run away or resist physically or anything like that. You should just say with words politely what, you're, what you, you know, your assertion of your own rights. Um, but you shouldn't do anything that causes them to think that you're run away, running away from them or that you're kind of physically accosting them in any way. You could just say, I do not consent to the search. I do not believe that you can ask me about my immigration status. Um, I would like to remain silent. I need an interpreter. Um, I would like to speak with an attorney. You can kind of have and practice these short sentences to say if you feel that you're kind of being accosted, your civil rights are being threatened, or that you're in some kind of situation where you're being asked questions and you don't know what the consequence of answering might be. Um, so if you're an immigrant, you can, you can certainly assert your right to remain silent and assert your right to an attorney just as you can if you're, an, if you're a U.S. citizen. So let me ask you, what if you, how do you know that you're on a deportation list? Is there, can you call somebody? How do you know? I mean, it's a tough question. I think, so some people have um, what's called a final order of removal from a long time ago. So some people, for example, might have come in, let's say in 1997 or something, and been stopped at the border and been issued um, an order of deportation without their, without their being present. Um, 
So if you have a final order of removal, you can find that out by um, uh, essentially calling a number that tells you whether, you know, you, if you have, the, so Im immigrants, many immigrants who have been stopped by, uh, by immigration authorities will have something called an A number. And if you know your A number or if you have your um, name and some other information, there is a phone number that you can call to find out if there's a deportation order against you. Um, but generally speaking, people are not like on a deportation list. Um, it's just that if you don't have lawful immigration status and immigration enforcement knows about you, they can target you. They can come and get you at your home. Um, you know, and th there are ways to find out what your status is, but again, I think the best situation, if you're someone who feels like your status is at risk um, or you are at risk, the best thing to do is to consult with an immigration attorney and see whether there might be options for you. Um, all right, so um, before we're closing up, but I wanted to go over those magic words you talked about again. Right. Could you repeat those so people can know what they are? Yes, so some magic words include, um, uh, I am asserting my right to remain silent. I would like to speak with an attorney. Uh, I do not consent to this search. I do not consent to your entry if you're in a home, right? So I do not consent to your entry. I do not consent to the search. I am asserting my right to remain silent. I would like to speak with an attorney. That's excellent. And if somebody wants to contact you, because you said, as you said, it's a case-by-case -case basis, how do they contact you? Uh, well, uh, I guess you can reach me at um, uh, my email address, which is uh, serene.chabaya at ayya.yale.edu. Okay. Um, and I'm also on Twitter. <laughs> All right. Well, Easy thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, and we really appreciate this information. And if you want more information about immigration status or other, or other shows, you can go to our website at www.chatwiththelawyer.tv. We provide great information. If you're interested in an attorney also, you can go to our website. And thank you for watching. One theft every six and a half minutes. 156 thefts every day. Car thieves appreciate all the help they can get, so here's a shout out to the more than 57,000 drivers who admittedly made it easy for the thieves last year. 57,000 who left the keys in their vehicle and had it stolen. A 22% increase in just a year. Old habits die hard, and thieves can't help themselves, especially when it's so easy. So why is it so difficult for some people to turn off the car, take the key or the fob, and lock it up before they walk away? Turn off the ignition and lock your vehicle every time you get out. Don't leave keys or fobs inside. Put all valuables out of sight, in the trunk, or take them with you. Lock it before you leave it. Don't make it easy for the thief. If you know something about vehicle theft or insurance fraud, call us at 1-800-TELL-NICB. That's 1-800-TEL-NICB. A public service message from the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Life is full of bittersweet transitions. It's difficult to know how these changes will impact us over time. They can hit harder than expected and may contribute to feelings of hopelessness. You good, sir? Or even thoughts of suicide. We got this. Support from friends and family can make a big difference to a veteran going through a difficult time. We've got this, Dad. Yeah. All right. Let's go. I got this. Together, our actions could help save a life. Learn more at VeteransCrisisLine.net. 
An oncologist is a cancer doctor. Neuroblastoma is a cancer that mostly affects kids. Do the kids in your grade know these words? Probably not. Uh, I don't think. <laughs>